Hello, Junkie. Hello, Junkie. This is the second to last episode of the Nocturnal Throwback Show. Yes, the podcast where we re-podcast the original Nocturnal in which I wrote a chapter a week, edited it, recorded it, and released it all while working two jobs and doing a bunch of other stuff too. Next week, the Nocturnal Throwback all finishes. It's over. It's over, which means we are almost to the nocturnal throwback Q&A episode. We are going to do the Q&A as a live stream episode, something that has never been accomplished before or even attempted in the history of mankind. I invented live streaming just for this particular moment. We're going to do that live stream on Thursday, November 12th, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, live at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler, twitch.tv slash Scott Sigler, and youtube.com slash Scott Sigler. We are then going to strip the audio off that live stream, and we're going to put that into the podcast feed on Sunday, November 15th. So if you don't make the live stream, you still get to enjoy the Q&A episode. You don't even have to tune in the live stream if you want to hear your own voice on the show. What? What? Uh, FDO, I can hear my own voice on the Q&A. Yes, you can. Get your question emailed to info at empty set. Dot com by midnight Pacific time on Monday, November 9th. A will read that question. I'll respond live in the show. You also have the option to record a question that is 20 seconds or less as an MP3 or as cell phone video, both of which we will play live. If you send cell phone video, again, make sure it is 20 seconds or less. Shoot it vertical and don't do any fancy editing. Now, it is time for your ears and face and nose and other holes in your body to ingest intake, slip into the second to last episode of Nocturnal Throwback. Coming up next, the original talkie talk from way back in 2008. Then you're going to get that episode slapping you about the face and the midriff. Enjoy! Ya! Welcome to the free podcast novel, Nocturnal. This is episode number 39. If this is the first time you've heard the story, that's right, there are 38 episodes that precede this one. If you want to start from the beginning, go to scottsigler.com slash nocturnal beginning. Nocturnal is a podcast-only novel. You can't buy in stores and you can't peek at the end. Written and performed by Scott Sigler. More information and more free stories available at scottsigler.com. This book contains adult language, mature situations, and lots and lots of violence. Hello there, junkies. Welcome to Nocturnal, episode number 39. Now, some of you will be thrilled with this message, and some of you will be pissed at this message, but episode 39 is not the final episode. I put so much work into the final episode and wrote so much cool stuff. It's actually going to have to extend it to episode 40. Now, the reason for that is people tell me that when podcast episodes go over an hour, it can gum up the works on a lot of podcatchers and a lot of RSS clients. I'm not quite sure if that's true because I am a tech hard and don't know such things. But some people that I do trust when it comes to production told me this, so I'm breaking them up. We've got 45 minutes of pure, uncut unrefined raw story for you and that's going to be good and i wanted to cut it off at 45 minutes because the new junkie signups are going absolutely batshit and we're closing in on like like 30 to 60 a day people are signing up it's a little nuts so if i'm going to get caught up saying hello to all these new junkies i'm gonna have to do it every episode we'll be saying hello to another 50 new junkies at the end of this episode We will also be talking about the Contagious Poster Contest. Now, some of you may have seen a PDF poster show up in your RSS or in your iTunes feed. There's a whole story behind that. I'm going to tell you all about it. So if you saw that the Domrec Wants You poster PDF in your feed, if you took a look at that, I will definitely tell you what that's all about. And if you didn't see anything, there's some real cool shit going on and you're going to want to check it out. No story so far, because I ain't got time to bleed. Let's just get right into Nocturnal, episode number 39. Tricky Dick's timing had been perfect. Maybe that was luck. Or maybe he knew more about explosives than he let on. But whatever the reason, he delivered exactly what Rex, the king, Depravdachuk, had asked for. 
The C-4 detonated deep in the engine room of the Jeremiah O'Brien. Concussive power radiated outward in the confined, machine-filled space, ripping joints, tearing rivets, and bending thick sheets of metal like soft plastic. The O'Brien's driving brass pistons, pistons that had powered the ship across the Atlantic, buckled and twisted and flew away from their moorings, giant pieces of shrapnel weighing several tons each. Gears and wheels formed new shapes, more abstract art than the functional machinery that they would never be again. Fuel lines ruptured, spraying burning jets of fire across the once pristine engine room. Much of the blast drove down, rending the metal hull with small gashes that instantly sprouted high plumes of spraying water as the hungry bay sought to fill the airspace inside the O'Brien's bulk. When whole, the ship displaced 14,300 tons of water. All that liquid pressed against the hull, and when it found a way inside, it shot upwards with the force of a hydraulic water cannon. More of the explosion drove upwards, rocketing with heat and concussive force. The fireball shockwave bent metal ladders and twisted great platforms as it expanded, and it rose in the blink of an eye. At the top of the stairs, the fireball jetted through the open door, catching Pierre from behind, smashing his face into the inside top of the doorframe before flipping him upside down and cracking him against the wall. That same concussive force and super-hot initial blast pummeled and scorched San Francisco Police Chief Amy Zoe, tearing her clothes from her arms, blistering the skin on her face and hands, even as it smashed her into the ceiling so hard three ribs cracked. But the blast wave wasn't finished, not by a long shot. It raged through the superstructure that sat above the engine room, shattering concrete floors, warping metal, burning paint free from steel, shattering glass, and splintering wood. Like a chimney, funneling the heat of a hellish fire, the blast shot up through the superstructure, even cracking the concrete roof on its way out. Two of the machine gun nests perched on the corners broke free, one in the front left, one in the rear right, both plummeting down, tons of concrete and metal dropping towards the lifeboat decks below. Just as the Jeremiah O'Brien passed under the Golden Gate Bridge, the fireball billowed up like a rising phoenix, reaching, roiling. The fireball did exactly what Rex Depravdachuk asked for. The flames and heat and hell licked up and scorched the bridge. Drivers crossing the expanse, sleepy or drunk or both, barely paying attention at 4.30 a.m., found themselves suddenly engulfed by glowing orange flames or driving 50 miles an hour straight into the hateful breath of a dragon. Foggy pitch black in headlights one second, surprise and shock and steering wheel yanking panic the next. Two drivers in the northbound lane turned to the left, a reaction more than a decision, putting their cars in the southbound lane. Before the fireball even passed, head-on collisions launched broken glass, bent metal, twisted frames, and cracked radiators. Those that wore seatbelts snapped forward, suffering the kinetic jerk of a combined 110-mile-per-hour crash. Those that did not sailed out of windshields, torn to pieces by the collision. Whatever remained alive left sure to die when bodies impacted oncoming traffic. Cars swerved when there was no place to swerve. Semis drove straight forward because there was nothing else they could do. Front to rear, front to rear, north lane and south lane, 50 cars piled up in the span it takes to draw a slow, deep breath. In the time it took to draw a second deep breath, Blood started to drip from the Golden Gate Bridge to the black water beneath and splatter across the foredeck of the Jeremiah O'Brien. Even as the traffic on the bridge came to a sudden and all-encompassing halt, a black Dodge Magnum with tinted windows plowed into the back of a Toyota Prius, lifting the Prius's rear end and throwing the car forward into a red Hummer. The Magnum's occupants flew around the inside of the car, the shock of a 50-mile-per-hour collision and powerful airbags stunning them, leaving them blinking bleeding, and nearly unconscious. Under the starboard lifeboat deck, the concussive blast ripped open the bulkhead on Brian's left. The metal tore not five feet in front of him, and a chest-high wall of flame shot across the walkway. Brian ducked and knelt, instinctively holding his left arm in front of his face to block the heat. A smashing sound behind him made him dive forward through the last edges of the passing flame wall. He hit and rolled on his right shoulder. It hurt, but not as bad as before. Then he came up to face the threat behind him. No threat. One of the machine gun nests had fallen off the top deck, 
smashing through a lifeboat and the boat deck to embed in the walkway. The big, broken pieces of the curved machine gun nest seemed to hang for a moment, then rolled off the side and plummeted sixty feet to the water below. In their place, they left a concrete, dust-covered negative space of bent metal. Brian had just missed being blown right off the ship or being crushed by the falling machine gun nest. Five feet either way, and he would have been dead, in the water, or both. A secondary blast sent a shudder through the hull. Debris littered the walkway. Brian limped to the gigantic dent caused by the falling machine gun nest. He picked up a long piece of metal, either a pipe or a handrail, he wasn't sure, then turned again and headed for the front of the ship. Pookie Chang didn't know where to run. He crouched on the inside port rail, his cloak spread over the two ten-year-olds that huddled next to him, shivering from fear. Thick black smoke billowed out of windows up and down the superstructure. He was halfway between the rear cannon deck and the superstructure, a good hundred feet from the flickering flames and the column of thick black smoke, yet he could feel the heat from here. He didn't know jack squat about ships. Did the black smoke mean the engine was on fire? The oil or the gas or whatever? Where was the gas tank anyway? He'd seen enough History Channel footage to know that when a ship blew, it fucking blew. He had no weapons. His body felt like he'd been a Rodney King stand-in at an L.A. police reunion party. If it came to a gun battle, he was screwed, and if it came down to -to hand-to-hand, he'd have trouble whipping little Murr, let alone a grown man, or one of those fucking monsters. And if he did have to fight and lost, there would be no one to get the girls off the ship. He had to find Brian, but he couldn't leave the girls alone. Too much danger. Fire, explosion, guns, Italians, Russians, monsters. Couldn't leave the girls, couldn't take them with, and the longer he had them on the ship, the longer they were at risk. Chief Zoe had told him to get the girls to safety. Fuck, that was the very reason Brian had gone all Chuck Norris, to draw attention so Pookie could rescue Murr and Tabs. Now he had the girls. On a burning ship in the middle of the goddamn San Francisco Bay, with every lifeboat useless. 4.30 in the fucking morning. If he went over the side, the current could take him out into the ocean. Two hours before daylight. How far could they go, and what were the girls' chances out in the open water? Could he get to one of the towers that held up the bridge? And if he could, could he hang on until morning and be rescued for sure? If not, if he couldn't reach them, the same current that had made escape attempts from Alcatraz Island lethal for decades would take him as well. He stood briefly, just enough to peek over the rail. The girls clung to him as he did, as if he might indeed leave them, and they would hold fast to prevent such a possibility. As if the fire, the monsters, and the gangsters weren't enough, he still had a sixty-foot drop to the water. Six stories, straight down just to get to the water and take a big chance on reaching the support tower before being drawn out to sea. The support tower led up to the bridge's main deck, some 200 feet up above. The column of black smoke rising up from the superstructure withered in and around that car deck. Up there, Pookie saw other flames, smaller flames. A six-story fall at night into the ocean. A fall like that could knock the girls out. Hell, could knock Pookie out. All of them, maybe drownings to follow shortly thereafter. Then Pookie noticed it. Hard to sense at first. It was so subtle, but once he locked onto it, there was no mistake. The boat was listing to port. Ever so slowly, the water was coming up to meet him. If he could survive just a little while longer, that six-story drop would turn into five, four, and maybe even less. The foredeck had warped like a flapped blanket as the shockwave rolled through the ship, knocking Sly into the air and throwing him towards the front of the boat. He'd landed hard amongst flying debris, concrete, bent metal, broken pipes, flying rivets, and skidded on his hands and forearms, his bloody right leg leaving a splattery trail behind him. That fuckstick with the machine gun and the helicopter had hit him in the thigh and it hurt. He'd been shot before, but never by something that big. Probably lucky his leg was still attached. It would heal. 
Within 20 or 30 minutes, he'd be able to move, and it would be completely fine within a couple of hours. The blessings of being one of Marie's children. Sly slid the family-killing knife inside his suit vest, so he could keep both hands on his 44 auto mag. He looked up front. There was the king, on the prow cannon platform, ten feet above the deck. He was covered in blood, but not his blood, judging from the condition of Devil Dan lying on the concrete at his feet. My king, Sly called out. Are you all right? Yes, Rex said. Come on, let's get out of here. Sly nodded and started limping towards the cannon platform. Through the fog, he saw the white yacht off the starboard side, near the O'Brien's rear, much closer than it was supposed to be. Lights from the Golden Gate high above cast strange, multi-headed shadows on the O'Brien's deck. The prow was past the span, the superstructure still driving its column of smoke into the southbound lane, which was the bridge's west side. The rear of the O'Brien was about to pass directly underneath the Golden Gate. Sly, look out! A warning from Rex. Sly made the mistake of looking back to Rex on the prow gun platform instead of looking around, or looking behind. In the instant it took him to realize his mistake, he felt a deep, stabbing pain in his lower left back. A piece of jagged pipe, now smeared with his blood, jutted out of his belly, pulling a strand of intestine along with it. A scream raged out of his mouth, the pain so blinding, so overwhelming, and yet he turned to his left, bringing the forty-four automag around. Or he tried to turn, because he couldn't come all the way around, not with a jagged pipe running through his back and sticking out of his belly. Still screaming, he craned his head and reached back with the forty-four, looking for a shot. Out of the corner of his left eye, he made out just one thing. A childish skull smile, white painted on black. Sly twisted and reached down, pointing the gun behind him. Even as he pulled the trigger, he felt himself lifted off the ground, the pipe raising him up like a toothpick in a cocktail wiener. Everything blurred as he whizzed through the air, then slammed face first into the broken concrete deck. Frank Lanza wanted to laugh with relief. The goddamn thing was still flying. Right on schedule, Pete, the fucking Jew Goldblum, had come barreling in, hired guns blazing away. Frank couldn't see down a level below, beneath the gun deck on which he stood, but he assumed the Russians down there were dead. His heart had dropped down to his nads when the sneaky Russian bastards had fired on the Huey, but the Huey had banked away and kept flying, even returned fire. Then, the middle of the goddamn ship exploded. Frank simultaneously watched the fireball rise into the air, fucking up the Golden Gate Bridge, and watched the helicopter, wondering if the blast might knock it out of the foggy night sky. It hadn't. The chopper banked away from the explosion, then came right back in again. Whoever the fuck engineered the Huey, they knew what they were doing. Frank stood, then his knees dipped briefly, a natural reaction to the sensation of unsure footing. The deck was solid, but it was tilting tilting to the left, just a little bit. He didn't need an engineer to know that a tilting ship was bad news. Polly, Godless, get up here! His men rose out of their hiding spots in the curved machine gun nests and scrambled to the main cannon platform upon which Frank stood with little Tommy Cosimo. Keep an eye out, boys, Frank said. Let me call the welcome wagon. He pulled a white handkerchief from his pocket, stood tall, then started waving it in a big, vertical, side-armed arc. It was the signal that would bring Pete, would bring rescue. He was going to make it out of this after all. The pipe started to lift him a third time, but Sly grabbed it with both hands where it jutted out of his belly, planted his feet, and yanked. The pipe slid through fast, stringing more of his intestines along with it, a pain so severe he saw flashes of nothing but yellow and red. He'd torn free a piece of his own guts. Would that heal? He didn't know. The sudden yank forward pulled his attacker into him, and Sly felt the smaller man crash into his back. Sly pulled again. The entire pipe slid free of his stomach. Before he could deal with the agony, before he could push it away and act, 
arms snaked around his neck, the crook of an elbow against his windpipe, a bicep on the left side, a forearm on the right, and another hand on top of his head. Sly's breath ended as solid iron seemed to clamp down. He felt legs lock around his waist, feet slinking inside his knees. He had only a few seconds, if that. Sly had watched enough mixed martial arts pay-per-view events to know the score. If he fell down now, he was dead. I thought you came to get it all, motherfucker, a harsh voice whispered in his ear. You feel that sting, big boy? That's you dying. Blackness swam before him. Sly clawed at the arm under his chin for a second before he realized his strength was already fading, that he couldn't free himself. His big hands fumbled inside his vest, came out with a knife. Sly stabbed. He felt the edge cut into the top of his own left shoulder, then passed, then the blade stopped as it met some other resistance. The concrete squeeze on his neck released. He heard something slump to the deck behind him. Sly fell to his knees, the black spots growing in his vision, even as air shot into his lungs, a painful, desperate, burning breath of life. Triple scale was about 50% too little for this shit. She'd been shot at. One of the gunmen had fallen out. The ship had fucking exploded. Shirley had to keep one eye on the giant pylons of the Golden Gate Bridge on her right, one on the actual bridge deck up above, one in the Jeremiah O'Brien's burning superstructure on her left, and one down on the rear deck in case some other motherfucker wanted to shoot at her. And she didn't have that many eyes. The boat was slowing, but either momentum or current kept driving it forward. The ship's aft section hung far below the tangled, burning traffic jam that clogged both lanes of the Golden Gate Bridge. She saw movement on the ship's rear cannon deck, a white handkerchief waving in the bridge's blazing lights. That's Frank! Pete Goldblum shouted, again forgetting his headset had a built-in microphone. Get down there! Shirley looked at the rear cannon deck. No place to land. Her eyes scanned the ship, taking in the long tethering cables leading down from the cranes. No place to land at all. What are you waiting for? Pete said. Get in there! They'll have to come up by rope ladder, Shirley said. Get in back. You and whichever one of the gunmen is left back there, put down the ladder, but only when I say so. Then help them up. We have to get the fuck out of here. Pete nodded, then slid out of the co-pilot seat and headed to the back. The guy was certainly loyal. Shirley had to give him that. She had hoped the explosion would scare him off, make him throw in the towel, and leave Lanza to his fate. But no such luck. Shirley adjusted the yoke, moving the Huey closer to the rear deck. The round gun deck, surrounded by a metal rail, would have been a cozy little landing pad were it not for the long, black, 76mm cannon right in the middle, pointing up at a shallow angle. There were no cables or cranes at the very back of the ship, so positioning over the gun platform and dropping the ladder would be a piece of cake. As long as there weren't any more explosions, and as long as no one else shot at them. She looked closer. It was hard to see from here, but the angle of the rear deck was wrong. The boat was listing to port. She had to get in there, and fast, or there was no way she could get Lanza and his men off the Jeremiah O'Brien. And regardless of the reason why, she knew that Pete, the fucking Jew Goldblum, wasn't about to accept any excuses. She worked the Huey closer, watching her distance to the Golden Gate's deck up above and the South Tower that held it up, reminding herself to focus on the money and what would happen to her if she didn't get Frank Lanza off that burning boat. Burning. Heat. Broken. Cracked. Agony. Smoke. Dust. The stench of burned fur. All of these things registered in a way, but what brought her out of it was the sensation of sliding. Slowly. Just a little bit. But sliding nonetheless. Amy Zoe had never felt so much pain. Such scorching heat and sizzling skin that seemed to be cooking itself. Tears poured down her face, and a tiny, constant moan 
softly streamed out of her mouth, beyond her ability to control it. The sound of the world filtered in through some muffled presence, each sound soft and dull and unclear. All her thoughts seemed scrambled. Where was she? What had happened? Where was her husband, her daughters? She felt something slide into her hand. She grabbed it, held it up in front of her face, and looked at it with her left eye. Her right eye wouldn't open, and she didn't know why. It was a knife. Where had it come from? It wasn't her knife, it was... It was Savior's knife. She was holding it because... His pookie had given it to her when... When he'd taken her daughter's topside. He'd had to do that, because Amy had been trading fire with... With... With Pierre... Bits of rubble and broken glass slid across the cracked concrete deck, slowly when they were sliding flat, but occasionally they bounced up on an edge and rolled down with greater speed. A five-degree angle? Ten? The rolling pieces stopped when they hit a body. A big, scorched, furry body. She focused on the bloody, burned, gigantic thing laying broken and twisted on the cracked deck blackened and blood-slick raw muscles covered with what shreds of fur remained. Her husband was nowhere because he was dead, his head bitten off by this very motherfucker lying here bleeding all over the deck. The creature took a sharp, ragged breath, fluid in his lungs crackling from the effort. Still alive. The monster that had killed her husband, taken her daughters, the monster was still alive. Amy Zo groaned as she got to her hands and knees. She crawled slowly towards the bloody monster, each motion sending waves of pain through her chest and side, making her skin feel like it was at the bottom of a deep fryer. Pierre lay right in front of the door that led down to the engine room. Shimmering heat billowed out of that bent door, evidence of a fire still burning deep below decks. Pierre lay limp, slumped on his right shoulder, as if he'd slid down the wall face first, landed, and hadn't been able to move. His sawed-off shotgun lay next to him, cracked and bent. The explosion had done something awful to his long nose. It was broken in the middle, bent several degrees to the left. Blood pulsed out of his mouth the pool on the concrete beneath. He looked at her, brown eyes slowly blinking. He looked at her, then looked at the knife. His upper body wiggled, as if he tried to move but could not. His scorched lower body didn't move at all. In fact, he was twisted kind of funny. A broken back. Don't kill me, he said. Please. She had nothing to say to him. No final words. No last insult. She crawled to him. It hurt so bad to move. If he was playing possum, she was screwed. But she didn't care anymore. Pookie had gotten her girls off the ship. He had to have done it. Amy reached Pierre, then fell to her ass, right next to his head. She grabbed his broken nose as if it were a handle. His eyes scrunched tight in pain, but only for a moment, before he opened them and looked at her once again. No! (laughs) No! Pierre said, his deep voice nasally. Please! I'm, I'm sorry! Amy nodded. He was sorry. Well, she was sorry, too. She began. Pierre started to scream as best he could through his shattered mouth and nose. Dmitry Vaslov held onto the starboard rail as aftershocks continued to make the boat shudder and shake. He had to hold onto the rail. Otherwise, He'd slide into the rear cannon support column. Fifteen degree list to port. A bad, bad thing. Fuck this. It was time to throw in the towel, as the Americans would say. Time for the raft. Bless Nikolai. Always thinking of everything. Dmitri had hit the deck when the bomb went off. Now he stood a little taller, taking in a superstructure flickering up and down with dozens of small flames, glowing brightly near the bottom as heat rose up from the engine room. Black smoke rose into the foggy night, pouring through the bridge high above. The O'Brien was done for. 
He turned toward the back of the ship, but stopped briefly. That yacht had been shadowing the O'Brien. Now it was so close, just a few dozen meters off the starboard bow. Why would it get so close now, when the O'Brien burned and could suffer another explosion at any moment? More trickery from the Italians? He didn't know, and he didn't care. He had to hand it to Lanza. Dimitri's bag of weapons was good, but Lanza's helicopter gunship was better. And if Lanza was behind that yacht, it spelled more bad news. Arsene also held the starboard rail so he wouldn't slide into the support column. He held it with his right hand, his left still clutching the 9A91 submachine gun. Arsene, we go, Dimitri said. Time to get off this death trap. Arsene nodded and smiled a smile of relief. Dimitri heard a rustling, a soft whisper of wind, barely audible over the sound of the dying O'Brien. Then Arsene's smile faded. His eyes widened. He looked beyond Dimitri, to the open deck that was now behind Dimitri's back. Arsene leaned out to his left and brought up the 9A91. Dimitri saw this in full combat mode, his reactions drenched in adrenaline, and every sensual moment dragging on forever. Dimitri tried to turn, his mind briefly debating between holding the rail or just jumping across the tilted deck to the support column, lean on that so he could use both hands to fire. That debate lasted all of a tenth of a second. He dropped to his left hip, letting go of the rail, spinning to his right hip even as his ass slid down the tilted deck. As he finished the move and brought his weapon to bear, he heard a double puff of a silenced handgun. Hot wetness splashed the back of Dimitri's head, telling him better than words that Arsene had just taken two rounds to the face. Dimitri's head snapped up as his feet landed against the support column. His 9A91 was only an instant behind, but in that last instant, his eyes took in a nightmare. Tall, strong, evil. One foot on the angled deck, the other on the support column. A perfect stance to counter an increasing list of port that allowed this monster to hold Mark 23 pistols in each hand. Mark 23s pointed right at Dmitri's face. In that final moment, Dmitri Vasilov felt a rush. The specter of death magnified his thrill for life, focusing it, making it so precious and pure that he might have died of joy had not a bullet through each eye done the job first. Firstborn's guns traced the Russians' bodies that fell to the cracked deck. The man wasn't getting up, as evidenced by the missing back of his skull, but old habits died hard. Where was the king? The ship listed and burned. How much longer would it be afloat? Was the king above decks, or was he below, already dead from the explosion? The helicopter sounded so loud, so close, it had to be just on the other side of the gun deck. It wasn't part of Rex's plan, which meant it had to go. Firstborn reloaded, his hands moving fast from muscle memory, even as his eyes scanned the tilting deck, looking for threats. His hands blurred like those of a Vegas blackjack dealer. Holster right-hand weapon, eject magazine from left-hand weapon, pocket magazine, load new magazine, all in less than a full second. Then repeat for the right-hand weapon, also in less than a second. Both Mark 23s loaded, 24 rounds in all, Firstborn bent slightly, trying to gauge a jump angle that would land him on the right rail of the rear cannon platform. The men up there, right up above him, might also have guns, so he had to make sure he landed and shot first. Brian had lost count of his wounds, but being stabbed in the left shoulder with the ceramic knife that was a whole different ball game. His body screamed poison in a way none of the other wounds had. The cut felt filled with bubbling acid. This one would not heal quickly. He pressed his right hand to the wound, trying to stem the flow of blood. Sly turned, chest heaving, swaying a little and clearly weak from both the chokehold and the pipe Brian had driven through his kidney. The snake face wore no smile. Now, a hateful snarl wriggled across that maw. Blood and other fluids oozed from his stomach. A curl of torn intestine hung out like a big pink snake. 
Blood also sheeted Sly's left pant leg, a big hole in the fabric, showing the path of a bullet fired from the helicopter gunner. How could this thing keep going? He'd put a goddamn pipe through this monster's back, right out its stomach. What the fuck were these things? And for that matter, what was Brian? Because he was the same. Brian tried to move, feeling pain rocket through his body. But there was something else. Something in his right arm. It didn't hurt as bad as before. That didn't mean it felt okay. Fuck no. But he could move it now. How was that possible? He'd felt bones crack when the automag round hit his forearm and his elbow. Sly gripped the knife then knelt down next to Brian. I ruined your suit again, Brian said weakly. Sly nodded, then lowered the knife to Brian's throat. I get to go shopping, Sly said. Guess what? You don't. (sighs) You know what's so fucked up about our kind? The point of the knife slid under Brian's mask, touched his throat. Sly smiled once more. Tell me, he said, how fast we heal. Even as he said those words, his right hand snaked out, the movement excruciating and yet exhilarating because he could move it. When the word heal escaped his lips, his thumb slid deep inside the bullet hole in Sly's thigh. The monster's eyes shot wide open and he reared back like he'd been burned. The knife shot away from Brian's throat, towards his hand, but before the point could strike home, Brian reached out with his left thumb and sank it inside Sly's bloody stomach hole. Sly twitched, and jerked, as if he'd been stung in a hundred places by a hundred bees all at the same second. The snake-faced monster fell, first to his ass, then to his back, screaming and twitching. Even as Brian rose to his knees, he dug both thumbs deeper and circled them around, trying to cause as much pain as he could. No more killing, a small voice said. No more of my people die today. Brian looked up to see Rex to Pravdichuk, only a few feet away his feet wide to counter the ship's tilt. He had Monkey Face, the one Brian had fucked up with half an Uzi mag, cradled in his arms. Something had changed inside that boy, because Rex looked like a boy, only in size. He stood tall, and his eyes burned with intensity. The teenage victim of bullies was no more. In his place stood a leader. In his place stood a man. Rex's foot lashed out, the soul smashing into Brian's ravaged mouth. Brian flew back, his blood-slick thumbs sliding out of Sly's wounds. He recovered quickly, willing his legs to work, forcing his arms to respond to commands. He was in no shape to fight anyone, but he'd find a way, because this was what he had come for. Brian's eyes flashed to the left, to the bloody pipe he'd driven through Sly's kidney. The pipe was caught on a crane cable anchor, which stopped it from sliding down the deck like the rest of the debris collecting inside the port rail. I am your king, Rex said. I can sense you are one of us. Stop this useless violence and join me. A smell Brian couldn't define flooded his nose. He blinked rapidly. The feeling of family in his chest glowed hotter than ever, brighter than ever, and it called to him. Brian shook his head. No, uh, I'm going to kill you. Why, Rex said. You are one of us. Be with your family. Be what you were born to be. The glow, the heat, the smell. Something deep inside of Brian. Something in the hardwiring that makes you breathe, eat, sleep, fuck. Something at that base level wanted what Rex offered, wanted it so bad, there was only one thing on the planet Brian could possibly want more. He wanted Robin Hudson back. And that could never happen. It could never happen. Because of Rex. Brian crawled towards the bloody pipe. Shirley Bruce couldn't believe her eyes. This close to the bridge, there was no darkness. No way to mistake what she saw. A tall man, in a furry Halloween costume, appearing on the far side of the rear cannon platform. Not standing, oh no, arching over the hull like some wirework movie fighter from some Hong Kong action flick. He sailed through the air, so graceful, then landed in a crouch right in the middle of the Italians. He held long pistols in both hands. 
The pistols came up the second his feet hit the angled deck, each pointed at the back of a mobster's head. Even as the costume man stood, he pulled the triggers. Shirley didn't see muzzle flash, but she saw red geyser shoot out of one forehead, a nose erupt outward from the other. Both men sagged, but before their bodies even hit the ground, the two pistols raised and pointed at the Huey, at the open side door. Shirley heard bullets hitting inside the cabin, heard Pete cry out, heard the roar of her gunner firing back, but he rushed the shots. She recognized Lanza and little Tommy Cosimo on the gun deck. Tommy went down, not from the costume man's pistols, but in a spray of blood as her gunner's wildfire shredded his chest. Even as she started to bank away, she saw the costume man's right hand yank back like he'd been stung by a bee. His left hand remained level. It kept firing. The machine gun fire from the back of her Huey stopped. She pushed the yoke forward. The Huey tilted down a bit as it quickly left the Jeremiah O'Brien behind. Pete, she yelled, talk to me. I'm hit. Oh, my fucking leg. How's your gunner? A pause. Ah, fuck. He's dead. Let's get the hell out of here. No, Pete screamed. Suddenly he was up. He was at her right shoulder. His left hand pressed hard against his bloody left thigh, but his right hand looked fine and dandy. And it was holding a Glock. Don't you leave Frank, you stupid bitch. Turn this thing around and get back there. Pete, it's over, goddammit. Let's chat. She felt the barrel of the Glock press against her neck. I was a state championship swimmer, Pete said. I'll put a bullet in the back of your head and take my chances. Now turn this thing around. Shirley pounded a fist against her thigh in frustration, then pushed the yoke to the left. The helicopter swung around, tail fishing behind in a 360-degree turn. She pressed forward, looking for an angle on the rear cannon platform. What she saw took her breath away. The costume man, standing tall, right hand limply at his side, left hand palming the top of Frank Lanza's head. Lanza kicked, futilely, his feet swinging a good feet off the ground, his hands reaching up to the costume man's hand, trying to pull it free. Frank, Pete said quietly. Then two things happened. The first thing was that the costume man threw his head back and roared. The second thing? Shirley was close enough now that she saw it wasn't a costume. Frank kicked again. More of a twitch this time. A reflexive action. Then he shuddered. His face contorted in a scream, and then his head caved in with a splash of blood. Frank's body dropped to the deck. The monster's closed fist still had bits of Frank's bloody skull. He whipped his hand like someone flinging pumpkin innards away from their fingers. He wiped his palm on his pants leg, then drew his sidearm, aimed it at the Huey, and started firing. Two bullets smacked into the Huey's plexiglass windshield. Shirley pulled hard right on the yoke, taking the chopper away from the ship. If you're going to shoot me, Pete, shoot me, but I'm bugging out of here right fucking now. A pause. A long pause, as Shirley waited for a flash or a bang, wondering how it would feel to get shot in the neck. Shit, Pete said. That thing, he got Frank. Fuck it, just get us out of here. Shirley felt the Glock drop away from her neck. She poured on the speed, heading north, away from the listing and burning Jeremiah O'Brien. Firstborn holstered his left hand Mark 23. He reached down to Frank Lanz's still-twitching body and ripped off a long piece of his shirt. The bullet had nearly taken Firstborn's right thumb clean off. He hissed as he pushed the badly bleeding thumb back into place, then wrapped the strip of shirt tightly around the hand. That one would take a while to heal, and a lot longer than it used to take. In the past, in his first century, something like that would heal in less than a day, two at the most. Now, maybe three or even four days before he could use it again. Getting old carried a steep price. He didn't know what had happened to Devil Dan, Dragon Breath, and Lockjaw, but the mission was over. He'd killed the Russians. He'd killed the Italians. Now, to find his king and get him off the ship. This big ship. This big, burning, smoking, tilting, sinking ship. 
Firstborn would search anywhere. He'd brave the flames and the smoke. But first, he had to make the smart move and see if he could get the king to come to him. Brian Clouser stood, the bloody bent pipe in his hands, a chunky piece of intestine still dangling from the end. Tried to stand, because the goddamn deck was tilting so bad now it was all he could do to not slide down the lower port side rail. Debris skidded across the crack deck, gaining speed as it fell left to right and clanging into the growing piles inside that port rail. The ship groaned like a great dying thing. Brian still felt the pull, that strange draw of the teenage boy turned leader. He felt that pull, sure, but he felt raw hatred, just a smidgen more. You know you want to, Rex said. Join me. Blow it out your ass, fuzznuts, Brian said. You're gonna die. Brian worked to keep his balance as he started slowly closing the distance. And then a voice, loud and ringing, audible even over the flames. My king! The sound sent a shiver up Brian's spine. That was a voice of power, of command. Rex looked up, towards the back of the boat. Then he looked again at Brian. Rex paused for a moment before shifting the monkey man to his right arm. With his left, he reached down and scooped up the barrel-chested sly. It looked strange to see a small teenager holding two monsters. It looked like he shouldn't have been able to do it. And that strange vision froze Brian for just a second. In that second, Rex knelt and jumped. The short hop took him into the air, where gravity did the rest. The heavily burdened kid dropped towards the portside rail. The water kept rising. Not rising, really. An optical illusion as the ship listed hard to port. Only a two-story drop now. Not much worse than a high-dive board at the community pool. Pookie looked back at the smoke-spewing, tilting superstructure. It jutted away from the deck, at least a 45-degree angle to the water. Over the boat's metallic groans, over the roaring flames, Pookie heard and felt something crash into the debris gathering inside the portside rail, towards the front of the boat. Pookie turned and looked that way. He was beyond fear now, beyond surprise, beyond rage or any other emotion. Save for one. Sadness. Sadness that he had to leave Brian Clouser behind. The crash was the big snake face from Brian's dreams, and some fucked up monkey thing, both of them being carried or dragged by Rex Depravdichuk. Only about twenty feet away, and coming fast, kicking their way through the growing pile of debris caught in the portside rail. Good luck, Bri Bri. Pookie whispered. Then he clutched the two girls tightly and jumped over the rail. Nick Murray treaded water and shook his head. Such a fine ship. Such a shame to see it sinking. But he had to admit, this was even better than watching Battlestar Galactica. He saw someone jump over the port rail and splash into the water. Quite a fatty to make such a splash. Then he saw arms thrashing, but not one set of arms, three sets, and two of them very small. Children. Dimitri had said nothing about children. Flaming oil spread out from the sinking Jeremiah O'Brien, turning the bay into an undulating inferno. Those kids would either drown or burn to death, unless Nick did something, and fast. If there was one talent that Nick had above all others, it was the ability to swim. He put that talent to work and launched himself towards the three splashing people. And there is episode number 39. I would go ahead and promise you that uh, 40 is going to be the final episode. But I, I think I think you all know by now that I, I am a very uh, abusive future dark overlord. Um, for those of you who don't know that phrase, FDO stands for future dark overlord. Because, of course, I am a horror writer, therefore I am spooky. Therefore, someday, 
I shall destroy the entire planet and remake it in my own image. So some of the fans refer to me often as, uh, as the FTO. And clearly, clearly I am abusive. I lie. I lie constantly. I can't even, I can't even measure the stream of bullshit that spews from my mouth when I tell you guys it's going to be the final episode. I've been telling you that for a while, so I'm not going to promise you that number 40 is the final episode. You're just going to have to tune in and find out. Let me tell you about the Contagious Poster promotion. We put out 12 unique high-resolution PDF posters that have been embedded in multiple feeds all across the internet. Of course, you can get all the information at scottsigler.com slash posters. Each poster features a unique plot point from the upcoming novel Contagious, which will be launched on December 30th and is available for pre-order now, scottsigler.com slash pre-order. I think you guys are going to get a real kick out of this because the phrases are enigmatic. They don't point to a obvious plot point. They don't tell you what's going to happen. But when you get to that element in the book, I think it's going to magnify your enjoyment of the novel Contagious when you see the phrases that are on these posters come to life. And then you'll sort of be, you'll sort of be able to go back in your brain and put it all together again in rewind or when you listen a second time. And I think it adds to the enjoyment of the book. So again, go to scottsigler.com slash posters. You can learn all about that. We had a lot of awesome blogs helping us out with this. We had the blog of all things cool, boing, boing. Uh, my current favorite science fiction blog, io9.com. That's I, the letter O, number nine, dot com. The world's deadliest vidcast, Ask a Ninja. Uh, another poster is up on the ringtone and cell phone content site, mixer.com. We have that up on the Indie Rock Showcase, Accident Hash, run by my buddy C.C. Chapman. Uh, Mer Lafferty, blogging over at tour.com, put one up. Phil Plate at Bad Astronomy, which is a discover.com blog. He got a poster up that had some killer things to say. Uh, web marketing guru Chris Brogan at chrisbrogan.com. One of, um, I would say, that if you're interested at all in web marketing and customer relationships, chrisbrogan.com is definitely something that you want to be checking out. Killer Comedy Podcast. KeithandTheGirl.com, put one up, had me in for an interview, which was a blast. The online culture vidcast, Epic Foo, you guys already know what a huge fan I am of Steven Zotti over at Epic Foo. And finally, I don't know how the fuck this happened, but somehow J.C. Hutchins, J.C. Hutchins got his mitt on one of the posters, would not give it back, and I had to put him into this big poster collective campaign. He's a rotten bastard, that J.C. Hutchins, and, uh... All right, fine. I admit it. The reason he got his hands on one of the posters and wouldn't give it back is because he actually designed all of the posters and helped me out with this campaign. And I'm sure he has, he's got some kind of ulterior motive. I'm probably going to have to help market his books, uh, Personal Effects, which is going to be out in spring. And then, of course, Seventh Son, which is going to be out in the fall, both from St. Martin's Press. And uh, I hate to admit it, but since he did the poster thing, he's got me a little bit over barrel. And I'll just have to go ahead and help market him. So when you guys hear me pimping Hutchins' work over at jchutchins.net, you'll know it's not because I like him, support him, like his work. I hate him, hate everything he stands for. But he did me a solid. I'm going to have to help him back out. So that's why. I'm not getting soft, goddammit. So now you know about scottsigler.com slash posters. Go check it out. It's a lot of eye candy. It's really cool. And it's going to get you even more excited for what you're going to read when Contagious comes out on December 30th, which as I'm reading this to you now, I'm looking at the little Contagious countdown clock at scottsigler.com. 12 days, 10 hours, 23 minutes until I sprout the biggest chub on you have ever seen. I'm going to be able to walk down the street and club animals to death with this thing. Just like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. there'll be dead animals all over the place. Of course, I'll get arrested. I'll have to go to counseling, therapy, All that other crap, it won't be the first time, I'm sure it won't be the last. But I'm telling you, major, major chubbage. And now, what has become one of my favorite parts of this show, I would like to say hello to 50 luscious, juicy, awesome new junkies. As usual, we start with our new non-American junkies. I should say junkies from foreign lands, although all lands are foreign until Siglerism takes over the entire world. And then you're all native. From the UK, we have Butler and Hugh Essam. From Canada, Tokan. From India, Darkstar. New Zealand, Grazer. Wales, Zeon Wales. Australia, Mudguts. From Serbia, Infrared Girl. 
from Germany, Nezrin, and from Puerto Rico, Hamisu. And then the overwhelming, massive tide of fans from the United States of America. People like Josh L. Cooper, B. Beeman, Scormsby, Dan motherfucking Class. Dan Class signed up as a junkie on this site. If you guys have not heard Dan Class's The Bitterest Pill podcast, you're going to want to go ahead and check that out. Amy P. Reed, Mike Scott, Slinger, Solid Toaster, Chives, Alaskan Jeremy, Dubba, and you scribe. Jason Mahato, my new favorite name of the week, Kit Shickers, Doc C, Soup, and that world-famous movie star, Dirk Diggler. Yes, Dirk Diggler has signed up over at scottsigler.com. God of H8, Slot Guy 87, Seema Gorfan, My Anarchy, One Bad Duck, BH Bits, Etel, Joe Blitz, Rayston, Texas Bow Woman. And Texas Bow Woman, I'm fully expecting to see you at either the Houston Contagious Tour Stop, the Dallas Contagious Tour Stop, or both. And any of you, if you're wondering if I am coming to your city, go to scottsigler.com slash tour and see all the cities that I'll be hitting come January. Back on track with Lars, Andreats, Gazar, Ari Gaffer, Holly, and Holly, you got two accounts set up. You got Holly and you got Hablusser. Uh, go ahead and delete whichever one you don't like and love your picture. El Gordo Nacho, my favorite cheese head, Great Blue Human, Brain Sponge, Connor, Joseph S., Brockzilla, MD Symes, and last but not least, Kevin Harz. Welcome, 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 all you junkies. Uh, I am seeing that the vast majority of these new signups have their zip code put in so that I can let them know when I start coming around to their area. Most of them actually had pictures in their profile which is pretty impressive. So all of you guys are going to want to check back at scottsigler.com because in the next couple days, you will have a personal private message from Pope Siglericus the 30th. And if you're lucky and your picture is hot enough, he will offer you his moist blessings. And what better blessings could you possibly have out of life? And now on a personal note, I am getting the content out. We will finish up Nocturnal. I am Definitely going to shoot to have that 12 days of Sigmas taken care of for you. But another personal issue has popped up in my life. Uh, is, is, those of you who've been following know that 2008 has been a year of ups and downs. Had some pretty big ups with two hardcover books out from a major publisher. Can't complain about that. Had some pretty big downs with my father-in-law and my, my favorite uh, best buddy little dog passing on. And now another fairly serious issue has popped up. Not going to talk about it right now. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, don't need any well wishing on the site. I'm just letting you guys know that if there are any unexpected delays coming up in the next few weeks, it's going to be because of those personal issues. It's also going to be because of preparing for the contagious launch um, and and probably crashing to try and get the, the twelve days of Cygnus taken care of for you. So uh, no no further details for now. Just letting you know that if any delays come up, uh, there's a pretty fucking good reason for it. I hope you're all enjoying the fuck out of Nocturnal. I hope you all enjoy the fuck out of Nocturnal number 40, which now means I'm going to have to bump my Nocturnal epilogue up into the 12 days of Sigmas so you can all hear how things actually turn out for the people that make it off the Jeremiah O'Brien alive. And it doesn't look good for any of them making it off the Jeremiah O'Brien alive. I'll tell you that right now. So normally I tell you, we'll talk to you next time. This time I tell you, I'll talk to your asses tomorrow. Tomorrow when Nocturnal episode number 40 goes up, which may or may not be the final episode. Let me close with a promo from the Silver Wolf podcast and I'm gone. Hey, do you want a podcast with honest opinions on video games, movies, and almost everything else? Then check out the Super Wolf Audio Blog Podcast, or SWABP for short. I provide all this, plus so much more, every other week online. Check out the podcast and subscribe at SWABP.blogspot.com. See you there, pack members. You have been listening to Nocturnal, written and performed by Scott Sigler. For more information, go to ScottSigler.com. All music in this podcast provided by Uncrowned off their album Devils and Angels, available now at the iTunes Music Store. Is it-